Hey guys, welcome back. Russell Linville here. Uh, we're going to be talking today about common shoulder surgeries. You should have just finished up the lecture about general surgery uh, guidelines and things like that. So in that surgery or that uh, presentation, rather, you should have gone over uh, body positioning of shoulder surgeries uh, intraoperatively as well as uh, you know postoperative timelines right, healing timelines and also what maybe a course of rehab generally looks like. So if we get into it now, we'll try to make this quick, okay, There's, we're going to try to bucket this into those four main archetypes um, and go from there, okay. So as we make our way through, let's see, get the mouse going here, introduction um, to common types of orthopedic surgeries is one of the objectives here and also to understand basic post-operative guidelines, restrictions and precautions. So we'll be giving you um, resources on uh, these common post-operative protocols um, and different types of surgical interventions. So common orthopedic shoulder surgeries, so like kind of like a tongue, tongue twister, so for, <laughs> forgive me if I misspeak. So if we think about those four big buckets, right, debridement, repair, reconstruction, and arthroplasty, and we look at the, sh the shoulder in, uh, specifically the shoulder, under the debridement category, we have things like rotator cuff debridement, acromioplasty, distal clavicle uh, resection and excision, slightly different procedure there, and then also labral debridement and a bicep stenotomy. Under the repair category, we have things like a rotator cuff repair, biceps tenodesis, labral repair, you guys probably heard of um, like a slap repair, things like that, and then repair of bones, like ORIF, which stands for open reduction, internal fixation, or other types of fracture repairs. Uh, reconstruction, there's not terribly um, amount of uh, uh, reconstruction surgeries of the shoulder. There are some things with the capsule. Uh, one of the more common ones is called a superior capsular reconstruction, where uh, if you have a massive rotator cuff tear, um, they will reconstruct it with a, uh, believe it's um, a pig tissue, pig skin uh, tissue. Uh, maybe it might be cadaver skin as well. But anyways, long story short, you can email me if you want more information about that. We won't get into that. And then arthroplasty, so joint resurfacing. You have both a total shoulder arthroplasty as well as a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And both of those are um, uh, to help with either osteoarthritis or massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, as we'll get into, is more of a salvage procedure when um, when things go pretty south. So. Uh, let's let's keep moving on here. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about subacromial decompression, which is a type of debridement. And why it wasn't listed on the previous slide? You know, if we go back, I can kind of flip through. Subacromial decompression is kind of the bucket term we use for all of these things. Uh, you know, up up to the biceps tonight, all of these things combined. So, subacromial space, we know where that's at. Decompressions means they remove tissue, bursectomy um, or bone uh, removal, uh, aka joint resurfacing, which would be acromioplasty. They remove some of the acromion and, of course, distal clavicle stuff too. They're trying to make more space within a subacromial uh, region of the shoulder to allow the rotator cuff to move more freely through that space. So we look at then rotator cuff repair and we'll also look at anterior labral repair a total shoulder and a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So again, debridement is a term used for a sort, any sort of surgical cleanup. So restrictions post-operative are typically quote unquote two tolerance. However, we do need to consider normal tissue healing timelines, for instance, in integumentary system, capsular tissue, joint effusion and swelling might be limiting them as well as pain. Examples are on the next slide, but really as a subacromial decompression, um, and you'll see the rehab protocol here. So, you know, if, I'll let you guys pause it here. Of course, I'm not going to read through all this. This is for you guys to kind of have a resource. But, um, you know, if you, if you, what you should glean away from this is that in the first two weeks, you keep things pretty light. And then as the weeks go by, up until, you know, the first six weeks, you're working on mainly range of motion, maybe some light strengthening. And then after six weeks, you're progressing more so to strength training as tolerated. Um, they're limited by pain initially, not by their surgical procedure, right? This is just a, they're removing different types of tissue instead of uh, repairing certain types of tissue. So when there's a removal of tissue, it's much, um, it's a much quicker rehab process.
So this is a process, this is something that like someone with a rotator cuff impingement might get done to try to alleviate shoulder pain if their um, conservative, you know, treatment of PTS failed. And so a lot of people that like get back to golfing, do cross body adduction type movements or things that they require, um, you know, they get in, in what you would consider a typical impingement of position, um, they'll have this done. So uh, usually older individuals, you know, in their 50s, 40s and 50s, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's not these people don't typically need rotator cuff repairs because they're young enough where they're they still have viable rotator cuff tissue, but um, they're having impingement pain. So signs that therapeutic interventions are too aggressive, and this goes not only for this uh, subacrobial decompression, but also all types of shoulder interventions. Really, really inter any interventions is that increased levels of referred pain. Um, in the shoulder or to the area of the deltoid. And that would just tell you the rotator cuff's getting strained or the subacromial space, the structures in that area are getting um, irritated. So you'll get this referred pain to the lateral shoulder kind of near the, the deltoid um, tuberosity. The night pain, um, obviously laying on the side of the uh, in injury or surgery is going to hurt, but also it might get achy pain that wakes them up at night. Pain that lasts for more than two hours after exercising, that's never good. And then pain that alters the performance of an activity or exercise. So these are all signs that you need to slow down. If we look at, um, this is going to be a common uh, slide here where we look at surgical candidates for a particular procedure, their precautions and restrictions, uh, typical outcomes, and the potential complications. So for a sub uh, arthroscopic subacromial decompression, the surgical candidates are people with persistent pain and dysfunction, maybe they failed conservative treatment, they have positive impingement signs, or they have acromion uh, anatomy abnormalities like a hooked acromion, something like that. Precautions and restrictions postoperatively, you want to just follow normal tissue healing timelines and guidelines. You want to follow a predictable return to function, meaning uh, address pain, then range of motion, then strength, then power, and then finally return to activity, and don't go out of order there. So outcomes, typically good. I mean, it's just going in, cleaning some tissue up, getting out of there, and uh, evidence suggests that conservative treatment can yield equal to better results. And so the argument there is, you know, someone's having pain, uh, let's say they're an electrician, they're always overhead, they have nothing but shoulder pain, they can't stop working to come to PT as much, so they just get surgery because they can take some time off work at that point through short-term disability. They start a treatment of uh, PT after surgery. Well, you know, was it the time off from their activity in conjunction with PT that helped them or was it the surgery that helped them? And I think more and more research is coming out year after year that's saying that people that can actually devote time to, uh, to physical therapy and have a good game plan actually do as well, if not better, than people who have this surgery. So, you know, this is one of those surgeries that I think uh, we can really help from a non you know, non-surgical standpoint if the person's uh, able and willing. So potential complications, this is really with all shoulder surgeries, but you can develop chronic shoulder pain or shoulder stiffness, things like post-operative frozen shoulder. You know, with any surgery, you can maybe have damage to blood vessels or nerves. There's a risk of infection, albeit low with all orthopedic, uh, arthroscopic surgery rather. And then, um, again, I just mentioned frozen shoulder. And then, you know, any sort of iatrogenic injury. I always have trouble with that word. But medically induced injury, um, let's just call it mistakes or, you know, that sort of thing. So, unfortunately, that happens. As we move on here, we're going to move next into anterior capsule labral repair. And, again, I'm trying to go a little quick here, not to, um, not to uh, bypass any pertinent information, but to make sure we get this in a timely manner so that you're not listening to a two-hour lecture on all this stuff because we can go really deep. So if you want more information about this stuff, please reach out, okay, because I'm going to give you the, the overall rundown, and then there's going to be articles that support things I say, okay, so you'll get resources as well as this slide. So postoperative considerations for an anterior capsule labral repair. So let's just break that down, that those words. So anterior, obviously the front, and then capsulo, right, the joint capsule of the shoulder, and labrum, so we know what those structures are, gets repaired, right? So it's important to know the terminology here. Um, the capsule and the labrum are intimately related through uh, ligamentous attachments. And so, you know, essentially what's happening here is this is someone who needs a surgery, someone who has redundant anterior inferior uh, joint capsule of the shoulder. And so they have redundant tissue, which causes instability. So 
uh, anterior shoulder instability. So things like um, falling on an outstretched arm or having a shoulder dislocation or repetitive throwing all can cause anteroinferior capsular redundancy or labral tearing. So long story short, let's just get into it. So surgical goals. You know, this is typically like a Tubbs patient. If you forget what that means, it's a traumatic unilateral bank heart surgery is indicated patient, meaning someone who dislocated their shoulder traumatically. Addressing any bank heart or anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsions, aka an Alps lesion, back to its anatomic position on the glenoid. This is just a type of um, uh, this is just a type of tissue repair that takes place during these surgeries uh, to eliminate redundancy, and that's what the next bullet point is anyway, eliminating any capsular hyperlaxity. Redundancy just means laxity in this sense. So repairing any clinical rotator interval laxity as well. So those are that's an area um, more in the inferior joint capsule uh, that can become lax with a dislocation. So arthroscopic surgical, surgical stabilization is the gold standard at this point. Um, complex cases or revision cases can involve open procedures. So, you know, 92 to 97 percent get excellent results. And so if I remember correctly, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but, you know, someone who dislocates their shoulder, especially if you're a young male um, playing contact sports, has something like an 80 percent, 90 percent chance to re-injure. And so um, those rates drop precipitously with um, shoulder surgery. However, you do have to um, obviously take time off, rehab, follow post-operative protocols, do return to sport um, phase of training. So, you know, if you have, if you dislocate in the last game or two of the season, it's probably worth considering shoulder surgery or shoulder stabilization if you want to go back to contact sports. Um, otherwise, um, you can try non-operative. Uh, however, the recurrence rates, you need to educate the patient, the recurrence rates are pretty high. So, um, Anyways, here we go. I think I made my point there. So here's that slide again, right? Those bo those boxes or buckets. So arthroscopic anterior capsule labral repair. We'll talk about that. Um, surgical candidates. Again, anyone with anterior glenohumeral instability could be Tubbs patient. Could be an Ambry patient. You know, atraumatic, multidirectional, uh, bilateral uh, rehabs indicated, and then um, inferior capsular shift if failed. That's what Ambry stands for. Uh, you know, sometimes you get these these people that these patients that are genetically lax that just can't figure it out and they can't build tension so they need surgical um, uh, stabilization. Anyone who's a contact sport athlete, a uh, younger, uh, couple that with male, also a recurrent dislocator, someone who's dislocated several times, likely that you're going to need shoulder uh, stabilization surgery. Precautions and restrictions, this is big here, so you're going to avoid stressing the anterior capsule with your intervention, so you need to understand arthrokinematics of the shoulder. So I want you guys to think about this, what arthrokinematic movements, um, or I should say what osteokinematic movements create arthrokinematic slide and glides that stress the anterior capsule of the shoulder. So we're thinking what produces an anterior, what movements produce an anterior slide? And those are the ones that you need to be cautious of and, and avoid, essentially, the first um, several months. So be cautious of pushing uh, full range of motion too soon. There is some interesting research out there that, uh, you know, where the, the, the anchors that help repair the labrum, you'll see in a surgical video, they, they use anchors into the glenoid to repair the labrum back down. If you push range of motion too soon, those can kind of wiggle free. Uh, the construct between the, the labrum and the anchor is probably the weakest point. So we can rip through those if we're too aggressive. And then also that we're noticing that labral tissue is still healing, you know, even up to 40 weeks post-operative, so, you know, 10 months later. So we just need to be cautious of things. And then if it's an open procedure, meaning they have to go through that deltopectoral incision, the big one in the front, you want to have subscapularis precautions for six weeks, and this says subscapular precautions, but really subscapularis muscle precautions. So we're going to avoid, um, you know, external rotation stretching to some extent, and we're also going to avoid uh, active or resisted internal rotation exercises. That's 
that's for six weeks. They're also going to go into an abduction pillow sling, meaning they're going to be a sling with a little uh, pillow that puts their arm into abduction and slight external rotation, or ex excuse me, maybe more neutral positioning, and that's going to decrease stress on the uh, subscapularis. That's open procedures, by the way. There's not that precaution with arthroscopic because they don't have to um, infarct on the subscapularis. So outcomes. Overall redislocation rate is about 18%. Um, this is a study from Abo, Abo Alada et al. in 2016. And redislocation rate was significantly affected by the patient's age and duration of postoperative rehab. The rate tended to be higher if there had been more than one dislocation preoperatively. However, that was not statistically significant. Um, severe dislocation arthropathy was observed in 12% of patients and de degenerative changes were significantly correlated with the number of preoperative dislocations, patient age, and number of anchors. The patient satisfaction rate ended up being 92.3%, so it's pretty successful surgery in terms of perception by the patient. And then return to pre-injury sport level was possible in 59, uh, 49, excuse me, 0.5% of these cases. So. You know, what you'll realize is you're a physical therapist is when someone comes to you for post-operative rehab, not all of them get back to sport. Sometimes their priorities change. Sometimes um, they find, you know, they find interest in different things. They decide that education is more important than sports. And there's a lot of different things, factors that go into it. And so it could be their senior year, so they weren't going to play again anyway. So those are things that might affect return to pre-injury sport level uh, numbers. Potential complications, again, Chronic shoulder pain, chronic shoulder stiffness. This is a procedure that is trying to create stability within the joint. So stiffness is a very, very common complication of this. Eventually, they get their range of motion back, but even for the first six months to nine months, it might be pretty limited in their overhead mobility and external rotation. Damage to blood vessels or nerves, of course, infection, post-traumatic, frozen shoulder, and then, of course, medically induced injury as well. If you want, you can check out some surgical videos at these links. There's one arthroscopic case and one open anterior um, uh, bank heart repair. By the way, bank heart um, means uh, bank heart repair. You'll see that term is the same type of surgery. So we can either say a capsule labral repair or a bank heart repair, and those two terms are used synonymously. I do want you to also look up what a bony bank heart is. So that's important to know. We won't go, go into that, but that's a little more complicated surgery, bony bank heart. All right, next up is the rehab guidelines for this. This is going to be a supplemental uh, document for you to review. Uh, it's the American Society of Shoulder and Elbow Therapists, a.k.a. ASSET, their consensus rehab guideline for arthroscopic anterior capsule labor repair of the shoulder. So Chuck Figpen here is the lead author. He was my main mentor in my residency, and so I've spent some time talking to him about this. Lori Mishner and him are really good um, partners. I'm not sure who the other um, who the other uh, authors are, but these two are big time names in the shoulder rehab world, uh, especially the literature world. So um, this is a this is a very well put together document with uh, not only what the surgical uh, operation is, but also step by step. Uh, phases of rehab and also a really good protocol to follow. This is what I follow in clinic. So you'll see that in a supplemental uh, document. Let's talk about the big gun here, the rotator cuff repair. Everyone knows someone with a rotator cuff repair, I feel like. Um, excuse me, sorry. Some, so I took this slide, this uh, title slide <laughs> from my, as I notice here, this title slide from my class a few years ago uh, that I taught. And so you'll see that this uh, <laughs> this title slide's from March 22nd, 2017. But I promise the information's updated. <laughs> so sorry about that. Didn't change the date there. Uh, so the etiology of rotator cuff tears, it's multifactorial. Uh, rotator cuff tears can happen through trauma, glenohumeral instability, scapulothoracic dysfunction, uh, meaning impingement, right? Congenital abnormalities, degenerative changes from repetitive impingement, and you know, uh, you know, chronic overuse essentially. And so this is a picture that, like, you know, really makes me upset. This one on the right. This is like if you type in rotator cuff tear um, into Google and then click on images. Like this is one of the first images that pops up, and so. You know, you see that you're a patient, you've been told, you just saw the doctor, yeah, I think you have some rotator cuff irritation or whatever, tear. And you go on Google and it's like this, this 
picture of this huge massive flap tear that's like ripped off the bone it looks like you know the chicken wing you ate last night you're like tearing through it and i just think it's i think it, this picture is just ridiculous so i don't know you gotta gotta fight against a little bit of misinformation in the clinic a lot of these patients do really well non-operatively but there are some that need it and we'll go over that as well and those patients over 60 years old who sustain a shoulder dislocation you know as we mentioned anterior capsular labral repair previously the the patients who are older that suffer a shoulder dislocation while albeit rare 80 percent of them have a concomitant rotator cuff tear so those patients may get some sort of stabilization procedure as well as a rotator cuff repair Microvascular studies have shown that there is a hypovascular zone in the supraspinatus, which is hypothesized as leading to tears. They call this the watershed area. I encourage you to look up um, that on your own, watershed, the watershed area. So um, again, you can email me as well if you need more information regarding that. So this is something that I want you to think about um, and fill these in on your own accord. Uh, severity and grading. So we, are, we, we tried to prioritize, or maybe that's the wrong word, but um, categorize rather uh, rotator cuff injuries by the severity. And we think of that as both longitudinal and, th and um, thickness of tearing. So um, I want you to try to figure out what a small, medium, large, and massive tears are in terms of um, uh, length of tear away from the uh, greater tuberosity. And so you have lengthwise tears, tears that tear this way on the rotator cuff, and you have tears that tear down through the thickness, right? So like a depth of tear. And so a partial tear is going to be one that does not transect the entirety of the tendon. So you still have fibers either superiorly or inferiorly that are hanging on. And a full thickness tear would be one that's obviously full thickness through that, and you have like a, a retraction of tissue. So um, if you look at the questions on the right, those are ones I want you to stop and pause and look up and what they mean. Shoot me an email with any questions. This is not a slide you need to know very much of. I think it's important to kind of appreciate a picture of of it. Um, if you're really interested in shoulder rehab, you should know these, but different types of rotator cuff tears because there's slightly different um, uh, surgeries that that help fix these types of tears. Um, this is looking at the a lateral view of the shoulder and this muscle at the top is your supraspinatus. You can see here posteriorly is going to be your infraspinatus and it's delineated by these fiber lines here and then this is the subscapularis of course. So um, you know different types of sub, uh, supraspinatus tears and some even extend like the massive tear will extend into the infraspinatus sometimes into the teres minor but um, I don't see those very often. I think it's important to go over this study by Park et al. in 2005. I still use this um, to help me uh, try to clinically diagnose or put people into buckets. Uh, essentially, they looked at what different special tests gave you the greatest predictive value of both rotator cuff impingement as well as rotator cuff tears. So if we move on here. Uh, for a full thickness rotator cuff tear with pretty good accuracy, a painful arc, a drop arm sign, infraspinatus, those, that cluster of tests seems to be able to predict full thickness rotator cuff tears well. And then impingement syndrome, it's, it's painful arc as well as infraspinatus muscle test, which is just an external rotation strength test, um, but also the Hawkins-Kennedy impingement sign, which you can see uh, right here. So uh, as we move on here, Here's another slide. I'll let you guys, um, you know, read through that, but it gives you the predictive uh, value, post-test probability. Um, obviously, the closer to zero point or one point zero zero means it's pretty accurate, as well as the likelihood ratio being above, um, really above one, but above ten is like extremely good at predicting. So there you have it. If we go back to this. Um, this table. Who is, uh, excuse me again, this should also say rotator cuff repair, so um, excuse me for uh, some typos here. So again, this should say arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. Um, to be honest with you, I work a full clinic schedule, and then at night when the kids go to bed, I do a lot of my slides, and um, 
I am one that uh, likes an occasional uh, glass of bourbon, and so sometimes I skim over some things, but then I usually catch them in these recorded lectures. So uh, arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. There we have it. So surgical candidates, really if they fail three to six months of conservative care, if they've been diagnosed with an acute full thickness rotator cuff repair or, or, or tear rather, where they've fallen on an outstretched arm, they're an older individual, and they're in, uh, they've lost a lot of function, those might get surgery quicker. Active patients that are less than 50 years old that just, you know, that have a tear, you know, a rotator cuff tear does not mean surgery, right? You ha there's actually some really interesting um, literature out there on function even in the presence of a tear. And again, this is stuff that we can dive super deep on. I can spend a whole lecture talking about. If you're interested in any of that literature or data, let me know and I'll try to send stuff your way. Earlier surgical uh, intervention is warranted for acute trauma resulting in full thickness rotator cuff tears. So post-operatively, what are precautions and restrictions? Well, you're gonna be in a sling for six weeks. They're gonna limit you to passive range of motion only for six weeks. You're gonna then from week six to 12, go from active assisted range of motion to just active, no resistance training until 12 weeks. And then at 12 weeks, you start with really light weights, one to three pounds, and then you, you build over time. Outcomes, this is by uh, Novoa and Baldo, Novoa Baldo et al. study in 2018. Uh, looking at outcomes of arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. The integrity of the rotator cuff repair must be considered when determining the post-operative rehab plan. You're looking at tissue quality as well as operative technique. You're looking at if the person's a smoker, if they've had a history of frozen shoulder. There's a lot of different things. If they're a type 2 diabetic, that can actually um, increase your chance of post-operative operative stiffness. And so um, those are things you look for in terms of what you might predict someone's outcome to be. Arthroscopic uh, repair can decrease pain and increase function, allowing patients to improve their quality of life. 90% of patients are happy at six months after the surgery and maintain good stability for five years. Greater preoperative expectations would show better outcomes in patient satisfaction after the surgery. And the potential complications, again, very similar to the other ones, pain, stiffness, um, and medically induced injury and then post-traumatic stiff or post-surgical uh, stiffness like frozen shoulder. It's more common. Uh, it's about uh, 3 to 10 percent of individuals after a rotator cuff repair will get a frozen shoulder. And they're really tough to, tough to manage. You don't know if they retore or if they have frozen shoulder for quite some time. So real quick, partial thickness rotator cuff repair. Do they get a subacromial decompression and why? Do they get a chromioplasty or a resurfacing of the um, undersurface of the acromion? Why? Distal clavicle excision? Why? Those are questions I want you to ask yourself so you understand this surgery better. Rotator cuff uh, weakness is seen uh, with just up to 30% thickness tear. So 70% intact in terms of depth, 30% torn. We can see weakness there and patients. So weakness is one of the common complaints to get a surgery. So if it's 10% torn, or is that someone that will successfully rehab, we can strengthen up the deltoid and some of the surrounding musculature to provide a better stability and function. Repair is typically performed in partial thickness rotator cuff tears uh, when it gets to a point of 50% or greater thickness or someone has um, severe weakness or pain. Full thickness rotator cuff repairs, you need to find out the size, location, and tissue quality. Who is your patient? Are they young, active? Was there a trauma? Are they, are they older, sedentary, poor tissue quality? Are they older, active, have chronic impingement? Are they middle-aged, desk job, like kind of an upper cross syndrome -y kind of person? These are all things you need to consider before a successful rehab. And what I'd like you to do is check out two videos. One's this arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, and the other is Dr. Richard Hawkins talking about rehab following rotator cuff repair and why it's so important. Dr. Hawkins um, is, is a great guy. Uh, I got to meet him a few times during my residency, and uh, so did Dr. Harris. And so we did our residency at the um, at ProAxis Therapy. Now it's called ATI but it's at the Stedman Hawkins Clinic of the Carolinas in, in Greenville, South Carolina. And, um, and we, this is where we learned a lot of our, our techniques and information. So we're big Dr. Hawkins fans. And this is, of course, uh, the Hawkins-Kennedy test is named after him. So 
Um, there you have it. These are just uh, schematic or pictures of what rotator cuff repairs look like. And you can see, you know, they try to create an approximation of this tear back down to its anatomical footprint. Different constructs you can use, different types of anchors, different types of suture techniques. Um, we would call this a, du a, a double row suture techniques as opposed to a single row. And uh, here's, a, here's a, a schematic of that. And so the double row construct is... Um, Obviously, you know, you can just tell by the more more anchors and sutures that it's going to be a, a better uh, construct for a rehab. And here's some other pictures. You can pause and read um, if you need to. So this is the supplemental document I'm going to provide. This is uh, Chuck Thigpen, who um, I mentioned was part of the anterior capsule labral repair guidelines. He also came out with this article I still use to this day. Uh, it's called Knowing the Speed Limit. And uh, it's weighing the benefits and risks of rehab progression after arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So this gives you some really good, knowledgeable um, guidelines on how fast to go with your patients. And it all has to do with size of the tear, which is why I, got, why I want you guys to understand um, uh, rotator cuff um, size and depth. So there's two columns here. And the way you read this is um, if they have a less than three centimeter tear or a greater than three centimeter tear. If they have a less than three centimeter tear, meaning a smaller medium, you would follow this left column. If it's a large or massive, you'd follow this column. So, you know, you can click through the slide. Slide one, slide two, you can pause on these and kind of look through. All right. So these rehabs are usually about four to five months. Um, and then eventually you want to transition to a, um, a home exercise program or even a strength conditioning program if appropriate. So finally, we're going to get to total shoulder and reverse shoulders. So I was trying to make this under 30 minutes, but it looks like we're just running over. So apologize. So if we um, continue on here, total shoulder uh, history. It was first developed, uh, dates all the way back to 1892-93, is the first known joint replacement. And so it preceded the first hip replacement by 26 years. Uh, the patient reportedly had increased strength and range of motion. Unfortunately, the infection reoccurred and requiring removal of the prosthesis two years later. Um, Dr. Near, so the Near test, he's at it again. The Near prosthesis in 1951, he created a hemiarthroplasty, so it was only the ball, um, and it had poor outcomes. So this is what it looked like. There was no glenoid component. It's just the ball to resurface the joint, and this was put into the intermedullary space of the humerus. So as we continue to move on here, what about reverse shoulder? Well, this is how you treat uh, degenerative and traumatic shoulder arthritis in the setting of functional ro uh, in the center. Of, excuse me, a functional rotator cuff. If you have degenerative and traumatic shoulder arthritis, you would just get your anatomical uh, total shoulder arthroplasty, not a reverse. So, we, and people with with um, rotator cuff damage meaning a full thickness retracted tear, uh, you will do the reverse shoulder to help create joint compression because rotator cuffs now not able to provide joint compression for the ball and socket. So if you reverse the ball and socket, the deltoid now acts as a, um, a dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder because it kind of mimics the shape of the reverse shoulder, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, reach out. So this unique design shifted the center of the glenoid or the glenohumeral rotation medially within the shoulder. Uh, and then this medialization of the center of rotation in a reverse shoulder prosthesis was a key step in overcoming implant loosening. So we continue to move on. This is what they look like. And so for a total shoulder, you have osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, uh, former shoulder arthroscopy. Um, and shoulder instability. For reverse shoulder, you're looking at trauma or dislocation or displaced proximal humerus fractures in elderly or an irreparable rotator cuff tear, massive tears, poor tissue quality, because um, then we're going to rely on the deltoid to help with shoulder function. Here's our boxes again. So again, I you know, uh, copy and paste these tables over and then I I uh, fill in the, fill in the uh, admittedly fill them in, and I didn't change the heading once again. So this should say um, uh, shoulder arthroplasty. And these are both open procedures, by the way. They're not, there's not an arthroscopic version. 
because they have their implants, right? So this should be shoulder um, arthroplasties. And so, you know, if you if you just give me a little grace on that, then uh, everything will be fine. So surgical candidates, total shoulder, patients with refractory pain and limitation of motion that do not respond to conter conservative methods of treatment. If they tried PT cortisone activity modification and avoided inciting factors and still having pain and dysfunction. Patient's age should also fit in with acceptable parameters, meaning the ideal is over 65. And then, of course, we discuss a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is some trauma or irreparable, irreparable rotator cuff tears. Precautions and restrictions, they're, they're like the rotator cuff repair. They're going to be in the sling for six weeks, passive range only again active assisted to active range from week 6 to 12. You will, just like um, the anterior capsule labral repair, uh, the open version of that, you're going to have subscapularis precautions because they're going to have to incise through the subscapularis to enter the joint capsule and have access to the joint. And then outcomes, there is going to be decreased range of motion compared to the native shoulder, both with an anatomical total shoulder and then with a reverse shoulder especially. You know, the the way the ball and socket um, are arranged in a reverse shoulder. So you're going to have the ball on the glenoid and the uh, socket on the humerus. And so if you can just think about like the concave convex rule, you're going to get to a point where the socket cannot rotate any further superiorly. So these patients are going to be limited in overhead mobility. They're going to get about 120 degrees of range of motion back overhead, but not much more than that. So it's functional in the sense of reaching, grabbing dishes, things like that, but it's, they're not going to be able to lift overhead. So potential complications, uh, and reverse shoulders have been close to 25%. And that includes infection, hematoma, dislocation of the prosthetic, uh, periprosthetic fractures, so bone fractures around where the implants are, and of course stiffness. And all those are complications of older individuals anyway. So you have you know, your shoulder arthroplasties which resurface it. Uh, and of course, you know, Older individuals will have more complications. Here are some videos you can watch. I encourage you to. Again, a little squeamish, but you guys will be fine. Any questions, shoot me an email. Um, here's my updated Franklin Pierce email. I appreciate you guys a lot. Thanks for trusting me and uh, look forward to uh, helping answer any questions. Thanks.